My name is Jeff Holden. Um, I'm the Chief Executive of Lear, and uh, there are various members of staff, most of whom have got their names written on them. If you uh, want any information, just see any of us at any time. Just a, a quick intro. That's a nice and flattering picture of me, but I'm never happy with pictures of me anyway. Um, a little explanation about Lear. What is Lear? Uh, we're a membership organisation for companies in the lifting equipment industry. And that's the whole range of businesses, right through the supply chain, including training, um, training for use, training and inspection, and so on. It's our 70th anniversary. We were established in 1944 in the East End of London and became a, a UK organisation. And now we're a truly global organisation. 58% of our members are based outside the UK and they're operating in 56 countries in every continent. And we're able to take a global view and what we're trying to do is to raise standards in the industry and also, if we can, work to harmonise standards around the world. Because many companies operate now in more than one country and it does help if when you land in a foreign place you know what the standards are and they're somewhere close to what you expect them to be. So we provide technical information and support for our members and membership is not automatic, it's uh, an application process and companies have to pass a technical audit in order to be accepted into membership and they have to make a commitment to achieve the technical standards that are required by the association. A big part of that is training and for over 50 years we've provided training for inspectors in the industry and we have a globally recognised set of qualifications which are actually now even quoted in job adverts for positions around the world. We, we work to campaign on behalf of the industry and on behalf of our members uh, providing an independent view rather than one that's particularly commercially biased towards any company. The Leo logo is fairly well recognised around the world and members have the opportunity to use that uh, allied with their own. We publish a range of technical publications. Some of them are on the table outside. We'll be revamping and renewing some of those uh, towards the middle of the year as part of our 70th anniversary celebrations. We've got some new editions of the publications coming out. We play a large part in the standards process around the world. So Derek Bales, who is my predecessor, is the chairman of the ISO TC 111 Standards Committee. Uh, he's now more or less retired, but um, he's been shadowed for the last three years by a graduate engineer called Ben Dobbs, who works for us as our technical manager, and he'll be taking on that role. So we sit on British uh, SEN and the ISO standards committees. Our members in Australia sit on Australian standards, and Ben himself has been invited to sit on Singapore standards. And we're able by doing that to spread the knowledge of what's going on in various forums and try and get some standardisation and harmonisation of standards. We're working with national governments, not just here in the UK, but around the world, looking at accreditation programmes for companies and individuals who work in the lifting industry, chiefly aimed at qualifications for lifting inspectors, but also ensuring that companies are working to a, a recognised set of benchmark standards. And we provide the opportunity for our members to network at events like this, at our exhibitions, at our uh, technical committee meetings, which we have every quarter. And it means that information can be shared and we can uh, identify issues and problems and deal with them as they come on. And the, the seminars and so on are also an opportunity to, to promote the members, to promote uh, what they do and the role that they play in the industry. As I said, 70 years, um, quite an achievement. Um, I'm hoping I might see the 75th if I'm not completely worn out by then. Uh, it does happen to coincide with my 60 year anniversary. And um, if you have a look on the, the website, you'll see I'm also running the London Marathon this year. So, uh, 
all funds gratefully accepted for the uh, for the hospice movement. Technical seminar, always good to start with a bit of poetry. Um, this one seemed quite appropriate. Um, I think it's, it's a fairly common one for what are the questions you should ask when you approach a particular task. So how does that bit of poetry help us? If, if you can answer those questions, we're going to be able to carry out effective inspections and effective maintenance of equipment. So what, what, what should I be inspecting? Seems a simple question, but very often the inspectors walk up to a piece of equipment without a clear idea of what they're trying to achieve. Why are you doing it? Well, you want to be sure that the equipment's safe and it's reliable. Very often, the frequency of inspections are not laid down. I've seen regulations around the world that say the, inspection, the equipment should be inspected periodically. Great. Is it six months? Is it 12 months? Is it five years? This is the sort of thing we're trying to educate people in. If you're going to say periodically, please state what the period should be. How do you do it? Is it purely visual? Do you need some equipment to carry out the work? Where? How do you get to what you're trying to inspect? I've seen people in the Middle East inspecting tower cranes with a pair of binoculars from 200 yards away. Not good, particularly when the guy standing next to him was from the Ministry of Labour asking him what he was doing. They didn't have the contract for very long after that. And more critically, who should be doing it? What characteristics <coughs> do you need in the person that's doing the work? Because it's not just about training. So where do you find guidance? Very often there isn't any. It's, it's often left to the inspection provider <coughs> to determine how big the scope is, what they should be inspecting, how often they should be doing it, and the extent of any inspection and maintenance work. And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be left to the inspection provider. As the association, I would always advise members to get clear guidance from their customers because it's all about liability nowadays. So the liability rests with the person making these decisions. Also, qualifications and ability of the inspector is critical. So the whole idea of redrafting BS7121 was to address those issues and to try and offer some fairly authoritative guidance to people who are both users and inspectors of equipment. And it's now called the <coughs> assembly part two, inspection, maintenance and thorough examination. And the key thing there is that the, the standards now encompass in maintenance. So what I'm trying to do in the, in the presentation really is to just give you an overview of what the standard series is, because we're talking here about a a whole series of standards, it's not one document. Why it was revised? There were problems with the old standard and what are the changes that have been made that address some of the issues that were identified? And then we'll look at some samples of extracts from the documents so you can get an idea of the style. We all know standards make wonderful bedtime reading. So it's not something we want to dwell on too much. So there are benefits. We've been fortunate to be part of this process and we're convinced there are benefits to the changes. So what's published in the series? There's a general section, part one, and then we have four other sections which go through the actual process of insp sorry, the inspection and maintenance. And then it divides down into subcategories of equipment. So mobile cranes, lorry loaders, tower cranes, and then offshore cranes, recovery vehicles, etc. But there are gaps in there to allow for new other types of equipment to be inserted into the standard series. If we look at the headings, we start looking at management and planning. So it's quite thorough in its approach. Management of the installation and lifting operations. Looking at contract lifting and crane hire how you actually plan the operation. And then critically, the selection and the duties of the personnel. So people aren't just walking on site to do the job. 
it's already identified what they should be doing before they get there and what the attributes that they have should be. The selection of the equipment, general safety requirements, what documentation should come with the crane, where should you site the crane, how do you put it up and take it down, procedures, all of these elements have got to be addressed otherwise you end up doing this. It, it was clear that there was some support required underneath the floor because we've got a prop there. But it's also clear that that wasn't enough and they didn't get it right. That was a brand new crane. It never actually <coughs> did a lift. They broke the boom, they wrecked the crane and basically it was written off. Luckily nobody was hurt. But you can see every week there are accidents where people are hurt. There was a, quite a major uh, crane collapse in Abu Dhabi and the crane actually fell down between two main roads. It was an intersection and the jib actually fell straight between the tracks at Russia. It only needed to be five degrees one way or the other, it would have been a major issue. So you've got to start right. We've also got headings about maintenance, the operating conditions for the equipment. What you do when you're going to use more than one crane. Weather conditions. The actual slinging and handling operation, signaling to control the operation, and then the, the actual process of thorough examination, which is what we're going to be looking at in a, in a little more detail. Ropes any special applications, and then there's an annex about training of operators and slingers. So, inspection, maintenance and thorough examination. We tend to explain when we do this presentation internationally what thorough examination means, because it doesn't mean a lot. It's a term that we use in the UK, but we don't use internationally. And thorough examination means that the inspection is carried out, but the inspector is expected to identify whether there's any testing required. And that's non-destructive testing, obviously. And it shouldn't always start with a multiple overload proof test. Sections 3 to 14, again, look at the safe use of the various types of cranes, mobiles, lorries, tower cranes, and so on. And these standards are being numbered so that they interact backwards and forwards. You look at section 14 there, it's going to all marry up with section 14 there. And there are sections that aren't yet published. And the reason for that is most standards work is carried out by organisations that do it for free. Um, I don't know if any, everybody's aware, but the HSE have not got a lot of money around at the moment, and they're very keen to get other people to do their work for them if they can. <coughs> And no one else has been prepared at this stage to take on this work, huge amount of work required to, uh, to do this. But it will come along in, a, in time. It, the HSE were the main drivers behind the modifications to the standard and they identified a number of problems. The first was that the, the original part two was oriented towards mobile cranes. So a lot of the information in there didn't really work for other cranes. It wasn't easy to use, it wasn't an easy standard to read, and you had to ignore the sections that didn't apply to your particular piece of equipment. It didn't consider at all the people doing the work. It didn't look at qualifications and it didn't look at the attributes and attitudes of the personnel. Didn't think about maintenance, and HSE we're getting increasingly concerned about the quality of thorough examinations being carried out. There were an increasing number of incidents and they felt that revising the standard was a first step towards improving standards of inspection. So what's been done? It's been restructured, as I say, to align with the safe use parts of the standard and it does look at the qualifications of the people, it looks at maintenance, 
and it introduces a new concept, which is this idea of a defined scope of examination. So it defines quite clearly what you should be inspecting. It doesn't leave it to you to make the decision, and it also provides some checklists to assist with the preparation of the scope. And the title changes to include <coughs> maintenance and thorough examination. So we go into subparts within the standards. So you've got a general section, and then we break down into the various types of equipment. So mobile cranes, lorry loaders, tower cranes, and then the snappily entitled overhead travelling cranes, including portal zone, and so on. Cargo handling and containers. Uh, Lee has been the main driver behind the uh, factory crane section. We've drafted the whole section and put that through the VSI process, but we've had an active part in the revision of the majority of the sections of the standard. So what's this defined scope of thorough examination? What are we trying to do? We're trying to improve the quality of thorough examinations by taking the element of chance out of it. It has to be drawn up by someone who's formally appointed by the company. So not only have you got the scope you've got someone signing it off who's taking responsibility. And it has to be specific to the crane being examined. You can't draw up a generic document. Because even if you've got two identical cranes, if they're doing different jobs, then your inspection procedure might need to be different. It's got to take into account the job that the crane's doing. And also, you've got to look forward. Uh, what we see a lot is that someone is working in a factory and they've got a crane and they ring up a member, oh the crane's broken down, it's not working. And you find that the duty cycle of that crane was never designed for the work that it's doing now. The, the, the factory's changed, the owner's changed. You've got to be able to try and look forward to see what it might be doing in the future because you, you're inspecting to make it safe for the next period of time. The inspector can add to the scope, but he cannot reduce it. So he's got a clearly defined list of things he must do, and he can choose to do more than that if he thinks it's appropriate, but he can't reduce it. And it's a living document. You've got to keep refreshing it, you've got to keep looking at it. So that probably demands that you've got some sort of structured approach to that, that it's diarised, that someone is going to review the document regularly. We want to concentrate on the, the people element of all of this. And the, the section 5 in the standard looks at various attributes that are required for personnel. For personnel doing pre-use checks, which is very often the crane driver themselves. The person carrying out in-service inspection and maintenance. And the person carrying out thorough examinations. And you're looking at two, two issues. The, the extent of a thorough examination is going to be much more than a, than a pre-use check or an in-service inspection. So you've got different requirements of the people doing it. So it lists out what personnel should be, what their attributes should be. Competencies how you assess the competencies of the person, how you decide what they can and can't do, and the training that they're going to require to be able to carry out the work. There's obviously a set of basic skills, but there's going to be particular skills that they need to do the, the work that they're doing. And you must have a training plan, you must keep training records, and it must be a CPD process. The, there has to be an element of ongoing, continual retraining, for the people. For personnel carrying out thorough examinations, we've got the same thing. Attributes, competencies. Then talks about a knowledge base. So the person carrying out the inspection, it's quite clearly identified in the, the detail of the standard that they should have access to the records of the crane, they should have access to manufacturers' handbooks, all the information that they might need to make a judgment about whether the equipment is safe to use going forwards. Again, they've got to have the skills to do the work, you've got to assess the competence, 
have training plans, provide them with technical information about the product, and then assess, train, CPD. So a very structured approach. And what we have to remember in all this is BS 7121 is a standard. But if someone ends up in a court of law and there's no law, then a standard is quasi-legal. So we can choose to do this or not to do this, but a, a good lawyer is going to say, well, that's what you should be doing. So we need to be aware. So right, you've actually got to be fit to do this type of work. If you're inspecting a tower crane, you've got to climb up the thing, you've got to walk out on the jib. You've got to be able to access all parts of the equipment that you need to get to. You've got to be able to see what you're doing. Sounds simple, but I've seen people inspecting without additional lighting, in dark corners. You've got to be able to do this. It's a visual examination. You've got to be able to access all parts of the equipment. So that might be working at height. It might be in confined spaces. So the person's got to be comfortable with doing that. We don't often think about attitude, but you can have the best trained inspector in the world, but if he really can't be bothered, or it's a bad morning and he's been at the darts match the night before and didn't get a lot of sleep, you've got to have people who are responsible and take the job seriously. You've got to be able to communicate with others because if you're inspecting a crane you might be the driver to operate the crane in a defined way while you're doing it. Inspecting the wire rope, you need to pay the whole rope off. You need to look at it closely. You need him to, to reel the rope in and out. I'm not sure which of these two I'm more concerned about to be honest, but yes, you've got to be able to read and write we were asked to get involved in a project in the Middle East where they were trying to uh, license crane drivers. And we got to the ludicrous situation where they wanted an assessor who had a master's degree. It didn't really matter what in, it could be chemistry or physics or biology, but he had to have a master's degree and five years' experience. And they didn't really define five years' experience in what. He was the assessor. He's never seen a crane before, doesn't know how to drive one. Uh, and then they had the driver, who's probably come from the Indian subcontinent, just been brought into the country, not literate, can't really read or write. So you've got somebody who doesn't know how to do the job, and somebody who's doing the job but can't read and write. And I didn't see that as a very good fit. And, and I said to the group, surely he's got to be able to read a load chart. And the guy in charge of the project said, what's a load chart? Um, we left the room at that point, and I don't know what they've done since. But that, that, it, it's as silly as that in some places. You've got to know what you don't know. We work on a, a great principle amongst uh, my team that we're never afraid to stick our hands up and say, hang on, I know that, but I'll find out for you. And that requires confidence. You, you, you've got to accept that you've got limitations. Okay, competence. We love that word, and nobody's really that happy to try and define it. In the standard, it says that the competent person must be fully conversant with the machinery and its hazards. They should know how it operates and what is required for them to carry out a thorough examination. They should be properly instructed and trained. The key thing is the, the training must be assessed. We're not talking here about turning up for a two-day course and walking out with a nice little attendance certificate. You've got to assess the capabilities of the person that's been on the training course. <coughs> and not unreasonably, you should record the training. And it's quite specific. Where was it? When was it? Who did it? And you've got to think about, again, think about a lawyer. We've got an evidence trail going on here, back through the process. That's what it's about. The person's got to be familiar with all the access. Have they been trained to use PPE? Can they use work at height equipment? Is there a rescue plan if they are working with using work at height equipment? How do you get them down if they get into difficulty? And do they actually know 
the equipment that they're inspecting. Inspectors get put in front of a lot of equipment on a regular basis and they should know the technical detail of that particular grain. They should know about permit work systems. A lot of these machines are in places of, uh, where you, you require access, lock-offs and all the rest of it. Other site specific requirements. And they should be trained to use their PPE. You don't just give them the PPE and let them get on with it. Okay, nice little chunk of information there. What's the scope of the periodic for an examination? So we've got a defined scope of work that's drawn up specifically for that crane. So we're talking here about mobiles in particular. Specific scope of work drawn up in advance and you're telling the inspector what he's looking at and what reports are required and what testing is required. So you've got a full brief going in. You're not leaving it to people to make it up on the day. You can't reduce that scope. It's not in the inspector's gift to reduce the scope. And it also goes further and it defines what you should be inspecting. And what you're inspecting is basically the load path. The areas of the crane that are carrying the load. That's the critical areas. And we, we've seen examples around the place. We, we, we were working with a member in Singapore. And they were putting up an 8,000 ton ringer crane in a refinery. And the refinery health and safety manager trots up and says, I want you to proof load that before you use it. And they politely explained to him exactly what would happen to his plant if the crane actually failed, because if you would go flying back and it would probably destroy half of his equipment, and he suddenly changed his mind. So it, it is about planning, it's about getting things in the right order. So what's this scope? What are they saying? We've got a very big list. We started putting it smaller because that's not the end of it, this is the rest of it. So we're being very clear now about what the inspector's got to inspect. So you've got to do all this and record it to carry out the inspection according to the standard. So we're not leaving things to chance anymore, quite clearly defined. And there are similar lists for all the different types of equipment. This one happens to be for the mobile crane. But if you look at the standard in the other sections, you'll find very similar lists. The danger, as I see it, with having lists like this is you end up with a tick box exercise. And we're, we're not, as an organisation, particularly happy about tick boxes because people put a tick in the box and they don't, haven't actually done what they're supposed to be doing. But it's going to be difficult to avoid that if you're going to demonstrate that you've done all this. Access is an issue now. Uh, cranes used to have nice little walkways and handrails and things like this. And increasingly you'll find that there's a crane, particularly a factory crane, put up and there's so much equipment underneath it, you, you can't physically get to it. So it's important that there's some thought given to the fact that this equipment needs to be inspected and you've got to be able to get up there and do it. You've got to be able to access all the various parts that you want to inspect. So the standard actually gives you guidance on access. So it should be a tool that can be taken to the client to say, look, here's the standard that you want me to work to, but you've got to make provision as well. We think there are a lot of benefits to this revision of the standard. It does give clear guidance on what should be done, and it gives you a lot of detail. It breaks it down into subparts. It defines the people that should be doing the work. And I think if we think about it, there are a lot of people out there, and I'm afraid it probably applies to some of the personnel of some of our members that, that really aren't as skilled as they need to be. And we're working with them to, uh, to provide the training and the input to change that. And it does cover all stages of the process checks, in-service checks, maintenance, and the thorough examination. 
British Dunders wouldn't thank me if I didn't give them a little plug. Um, as you know, these things aren't cheap, and I, I'm not sure there's not a commercial exercise going on where we'll split this standard down so we can sell you 14 of them instead of selling, selling you one, but it would be <coughs> a major document if they put it all together. Um, LEAR members do have the benefit that LEAR is a sales agent for BSI and we, uh, we are able to provide some discount to our members to buy these standards. And all the information is on the, uh, the BSI website there. That's a very quick spin through. Um, not a riveting subject, standards I'm afraid, but we, we all have to work to them. If there are any questions, I'll try and answer them, or other members of the team, we've got two people standing by with microphones, if there are, or you can come and chat to us at the end of the event. <coughs>